Peter Unger is Distinguished Professor and Chair of Anthropology at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Peter is one of the world's experts in understanding the diets of ancient primates. Peter, in particular, studies the microscopic traces of wear on the teeth of primates, and those wear traces accumulate when primates are chewing on different kinds of foods. Peter talked to me about the ways that he uses living primates to understand the diets of ancient primates, including ancient hominins. He talked about some of his work on those ancient hominins, reconstructing what ancient organisms were eating from the traces on their teeth. Peter, what do you think? You know, everybody has some ideas about what they eat and what the role of nutrition is in their lives. And when you start thinking about what ancient organisms ate, you know, ancient hominids, ancient primates, and how that fit in, in the sense of if I was to imagine what it was like to be an early hominin, mm -hmm. what you know, what am I eating day to day? What is, what, is, what is my life like? You know, how does food interact with that? Sure. Well, I think the best way to answer that question is, it's the old, it's the old joke. What do you feed an 800 pound gorilla? And the uh -huh. answer, of course, is anything it wants. Yeah. Um, I think, by and large, if you're a primate, uh, you are driven to eat whatever's available to you. Mm -hmm. So, essentially, um, diet is about availability. Mm -hmm. And when we think about the evolution of human diet, what we're really thinking about is we're thinking about uh, changing food availability as the environment in which we're living changes. Because in different places there are different kinds of foods that are available to eat. And our own ancestors uh, f tracked these changes um, related to changes in the environment and uh, found a, a niche for themselves. And Largely, uh, at least for the last two and a half million years or so, mm -hmm. it's been about uh, taking a broader and broader variety of foods, greater versatility mm -hmm. of foods. If you ask me what did a hominin eat on a day-to-day -day basis, that's a really hard question to answer because it depends where and when that hominin lived. Um, I could give you some, some interesting examples if, if you wanted to from the, the primate literature. There are basically somewhere, depending upon who you ask, between one and three or four species of gorilla. Mm -hmm. All right, the, two, the, the basic dichotomy is between the eastern lowland, the western lowland, and the mountain gorilla. Yeah. But you know what? Traditionally, we've considered all of them to be leaf eaters. Yeah. However, over the past several years, people have started to say, well, you know what? The lowland gorillas aren't really leaf eaters, they're fruit eaters. But the reality is there aren't any gorillas that are leaf eaters. Even the mountain gorillas are fruit eaters by nature. So why is it that everybody thinks that the mountain gorillas are leaf eaters? Mm -hmm. well, the basic reason is that the first place anybody ever went to look for the diets of gorillas was a place called Karasoki, mm -hmm. made famous by Diane Fossey, mm -hmm. a gorilla researcher. Now, the site of Karasoki is kind of unusual. It's in the high mountains of the Virunga volcanic range. Mm -hmm. And the reason that it is up there is because people have settled the bases of the volcanoes where the lands are fertile and it's easy to grow stuff. Mm -hmm. Now what that means is that the gorillas that had lived there have been pushed up into the high mountains. So there are mountain gorillas at this site, um, but they're living really high in the mountains. They're eating nothing but garbage. They're uh -huh. eating they're eating pith and they're eating stems and they're eating just leaves and all kinds of nasty stuff that no self-respecting ape would eat if it uh -huh. had the choice. Now there are other mountain gorillas that live nearby, mm -hmm. like in the Buwindi impenetrable forest, and they eat mostly fruits. Mm -hmm. They'll eat fruits maybe 10 months out of the year when there are fruits available for them to eat. Right. But when those aren't available, they will switch their diets to eating leaves and other tough, nasty stuff like the ones that Karasoki eat. Now, if we start thinking about this, what's going on at Karasoki? It's not normal. What's happening is these animals are perpetually falling back on the garbage, mm -hmm. right? On the, on the, on the low-quality foods mm -hmm. that they wouldn't eat if they had the choice. 
All right. So let's let's take this back for a moment. Okay. If you look at the anatomy of their teeth, uh -huh. if you look at the anatomy of their jaws and chewing muscles, if you look at the anatomy of their guts, all of these things literally scream tough foods. But that's not what they would eat if they had the choice. Right. And you know how we know this? We know this because a researcher named Melissa Remus mm -hmm. did some work in a zoo where she gave gorillas a choice of different foods. <laughs> right. She handed them the choice of mangoes. Mm -hmm. Or broccoli, right? <laughs> or cabbage. Right. Um, which do you think those gorillas chose every single time? <laughs> you know, I've got two little girls, and if I gave them the choice between a head of broccoli and a Snickers bar, there's no question they'd take the Snickers bar. Uh -huh. You know, they're yummy, they're filled with energy, they, they taste good, like those mangoes do. Mm -hmm. And that's what the gorillas, and in fact, all other apes, are really evolved to eat. We are basically fruit eaters at heart. Now, the gorillas do have this bizarre specialized anatomy that allows them to fall back on foods they don't want to eat, but sometimes have to eat. And that gives them an advantage, right. an it's, unusual advantage. It's like a survival mechanism. Exactly. And this is a particularly important survival mechanism in a place where you have seasonality, mm -hmm. in a place where you have rainy months, where there's lots of yummy fruits available, uh -huh and a place where you don't have rainy months, where you have dry months, where things aren't very good. So in effect, um, that sort of, uh, the adaptation that we see in gorillas. We used to think big flat teeth in a hominin told us a great deal. Oh, it's a, a, a nutcracker, but, and it may have been, but not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Certainly having that specialized anatomy puts them in an advantage when they need it, mm -hmm. but they don't always need it. Yeah, yeah. So you've become known for your study of the microware of teeth and looking at very close detail, microscopically, at, at scratches, you know, and, and pits. And, and how do you use that information to go to what the teeth are being used for and what the diet was like? We use something called the comparative method. Mm -hmm. In other words, what we do is we will look at living animals, mm -hmm. uh, ones that we know their diet, and then we'll look at their teeth. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that in many cases, the pattern of scratching and pitting on the teeth reflects the diet that different animals eat. If you eat a lot of leaves, mm -hmm. for example, you tend to have scratchy surfaces. And the reason is because the teeth shear or slide past one another. And when they do, whatever abrasives are, are, are on or in those leaves get dragged along the surfaces and uh -huh. it causes these fine parallel scratches. But if you're a hard object feeder like our mango bee, mm -hmm. um, they will crush foods. And when they crush them, then what happens is the abrasives on or in the food get pressed into the surface and it causes pitting. Mm -hmm. Hard object pitters, uh, sorry, hard object feeders typically have very pitted surfaces, very tough food feeders, those that eat leaves, those that eat meat, which mm -hmm. is very tough sometimes, um, those tend to have scratches. Mm -hmm. Ones with very broad diets have a range of different features. Ones with intermediate diets like soft fruits uh -huh. tend to also be intermediate in their scratching and pitting pattern. And that reflects maybe a week, maybe two weeks, depending on the diet uh, of, of, of what they'd eaten in the past. Because of course, once you create a scratch, it'll be replaced by more scratches as the tooth wears down. Sure. Yeah, it's, I think that's something that people maybe don't realize, is the extent to which teeth in most animals, and in many humans, are really wear over time. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at a surface that's continually evolving. That's correct. It's, it's changing continually. Yeah. yeah. Um, when we look at early hominids, uh, I'm going to start with afarensis. Um, Here's a species that we know a lot about its anatomy. We know quite a bit about what its behavioral ecology may have been in a broad sense, but there are many unanswered questions about it. Um, what do you think they were eating? It's a very good question. Mm -hmm. Afarensis is an enigma mm -hmm. to us. On the one hand, if you look at its teeth and jaws, it looks like it is on a trajectory, and I hate to use the word trajectory because evolution is not directional. Right. But it seems to be on a trajectory looking across human evolution 
um, towards the ability to eat more and more hard mm -hmm. foods. Mm -hmm. Okay, its jaws are a little bit thicker and wider mm -hmm. than yours or mine. Its teeth, cheek teeth, back teeth are a little bit larger than yours or mine. Its incisors are also, believe it or not, a little bit larger than yours or mine. The enamel on those teeth is fairly thick mm -hmm. overall. This would lead us to suspect that unlike, say, a chimpanzee today, um, they would not have focused mostly on soft fruits. Mm -hmm. They would have taken a broader variety of foods, including some hard objects. Mm -hmm. The evidence from the isotopes, the chemistry of the teeth, suggests that they had a fairly broad diet mm -hmm. because some of them um, show that there are grass land products. Mm -hmm. Others show that there are forest products. Yeah. The microscopic wear on the teeth, though, very strange. Mm -hmm. They're dominated by fine linear grooves or scratches. So these fine linear features, these yeah. fine scratches, um, suggest that they were doing something other than necessarily uh, smashing hard foods. Yeah. They suggest perhaps grinding mm -hmm. uh, tough vegetation, because the scratches aren't all aligned like a leaf eater. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Leaf eaters they usually have very aligned scratches, mm -hmm. but these ones are maybe because the teeth are flat and the teeth move more, mm -hmm. they look like whatever it is they're eating, they're grinding. Yeah. If you, if you ask me to guess what they're eating, I would say they probably had a, a fairly broad diet, perhaps including some soft leaf material, maybe even some, some grass-related material, though not much, mm -hmm. not much, because there is not a dominance of chemistry that would support that at that point. Okay. They were not yet hard object specialists, though. That's pretty clear. So when we move to later hominids, and we enter the phase where we have these uh, species called robust Australopithecines. And then we have these other species that are not robust. You know, they may be ancestors of Homo, they may be other kinds of Australopithecines, but they do not have the, the massive, mm -hmm. especially post-canine teeth. What do you think is going on? I mean, you, you describe the situation where there's these multiple species that, that are eating the same foods. Um, I wonder what is going on in the late Pliocene with these species. Well, it seems, based on what we can tell, that around about two and a half million years ago, there's this major change globally. The world's climate, or the world's, uh, the, the temperatures, mm -hmm. the average temperature drops, mm -hmm. it becomes somewhat drier, and the savannas of eastern Africa and the felt of southern Africa begin to spread. Mm -hmm. We used to think that that happened five or six million years ago um, with the origins of our own biological tribe, mm -hmm. but we now think that that happened a bit later, mm -hmm. starting around two and a half million years ago or so. It's in effect an evolutionary fork in the road, and this evolutionary fork in the road really did mark two different approaches, two different ways of dealing with the changing resources associated with the spreading savannas. Sure. Now what's interesting is, if the two species that we commonly recognize as the two later Paranthropus species, Boisei and Robustus, uh, if from two different parts of Africa, one from Eastern and the other from Southern Africa, um, are closely related, and many of us believe that they're just too similar to not be closely related. They're anatomically really much, very much alike. They are. But what's interesting is, if you look at the chemistry of their teeth mm -hmm. and the pattern of scratches on their teeth, they don't look like they ate the same things. They were both very specialized. Um, these big dish-like mid-faces, mm -hmm. uh, these big crests on top of their heads for chewing muscles, the, um, the big, thick jaws, big, flat cheek teeth. These mm -hmm. things, I, people have asked me what they were, and my initial response was they're Paleolithic Cuisinarts. <laughs> Anything they want. Um, they eat very different things, it yeah. seems, which again, extremely surprising because the shapes of their teeth, the size and shape of their jaw, their mm -hmm. chewing muscles, those are all quite different. Yeah. I mean, sorry, quite the same. Right, right, yeah. But the pattern of wear of their teeth and the isotopes were quite different. In Eastern Africa, the isotopes suggest grasses or sedges, isotopes being the chemical signatures in the teeth. Mm -hmm. The microscopic wear is scratchy, again, suggesting perhaps grass-like structures. That's the most, uh, either, either grass seeds, perhaps 
are the keys and grass blades. Mm -hmm. We can't say for certain, but those are entirely internally consistent. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, we get a different signal. We get a signal more like what we would expect. We get a mixed diet mm -hmm. based on the isotopes, and we get more pitting in the teeth, right. suggesting the consumption of hard, brittle foods. So, are we looking at an example like our gorillas, where in some cases they use the same anatomy for a very different diet? Mm -hmm. Perhaps. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think what, what strikes me as you describe it is that when you look at the anatomy, you know, your first reaction, when John Robinson studied the anatomy and he said, look, you've got these big toothed ones, you've got small toothed ones, it's obvious what's going on. And the big toothed ones are eating big tooth things. <laughs> and the small toothed ones are eating like chimps. Um, and, and to come to where we are now, where we appreciate that each of these forms was quite flexible in the actual foods that were part of its diet and, and that the same anatomy might be related to different kinds of diets in different places, different ecologies. But another key point is the role that we see in living primates of climate fluctuation, climate variability, and, and how species must be adapted to the, the extremes in a sense. Is there anything we can learn about that, you know, sort of context for, for understanding how our own genus arose? Sure. Um, what we see in terms of the anatomy mm -hmm. with early Homo is we see very subtle changes. Mm -hmm. The teeth become smaller. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, they become slightly crestier. Mm -hmm. The enamel on those teeth becomes thinner. Mm -hmm. And these are changes we would expect of something that is not driven to a specialized diet in the mm -hmm. same way mm -hmm. that the contemporary Paranthropus was driven to a specialized diet. Some might even argue that it, these would be considered adap adapted to the consumption of some tougher foods, mm -hmm. potentially including things like meat, mm -hmm. because crestier teeth and thinner enamel are really good for shearing through things. Yeah. So it may be that the strategy that early Homo took mm -hmm was instead of broadening out the diet, or ultimately even in, in the case of Boise, I specializing on the savanna resources, which are the grasses, mm -hmm. um, we're looking at something that, uh, that itself had a fairly broad diet in another way, including not just the vegetation, but perhaps the meat and whatever else it could get into its mouth. And the archeological record comes in and begins to support the consumption of meat at this time. How did you get into this line of work? How did I get into this line of work? I don't know. I've always been fascinated by human evolution. Yeah. Um, probably when I was six or seven years old, uh, my father took me to see 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh -huh. uh, one of these uh, late night, you know, I'm not old enough so that this was <laughs> when it first came out, <laughs> but one of these sort of late night shows, uh -huh. 2000, I, just, I just fell in love with the idea of um, understanding where we came from, how, how we came to be the way we are, why we're different sure. from the other apes. And, and, and I, really, I really enjoyed that very much. Uh -huh. and, and then, of course, little trips uh, in elementary school to the Museum of Natural History in New York. Oh, yeah. That was another, another big one for me. Yeah, yeah. So you were really looking for this field. Yeah, a lot yeah. of people go, a lot of my own students went into college with no idea what they wanted to do for a living uh -huh. when, they, when they grew up. And a, there are a lot of very successful anthropologists that came late to the yeah. idea that they wanted to do this. I think I kind of knew by the time I was five or six. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. If you were going to give advice to students, as, as I'm sure you often do, you want to pursue anthropology, you want to pursue understanding evolution or biology, what advice do you give? Depends on the level you're talking. Yeah. You're talking an undergraduate level. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, I would say a couple of things. First, go into it with an, with an open mind mm -hmm. and go into it with the understanding that there are more people interested in doing it than there are jobs out there yeah. to be done. Mm -hmm. um, be realistic. Mm -hmm. And if it's something that you love, something that you definitely want to do, um, that's great. Mm -hmm. If you're not certain, 
you need to think really long and hard about it because it is a long and hard road and there are a lot more um, people interested than there are positions for them. Yeah. Because I can tell you from personal experience, I did not have a tenure track mm -hmm. permanent professorship when I got out of graduate school. Mm -hmm. I had a, a couple of postdoctoral fellowships with some very, very good people um, mm -hmm. that kept me employed while I was on the market yeah. looking. Yeah. And, and, and that stick to it took three years, yeah. but that stick to I think, was sort of what got me through. But I would say, I would say if you're passionate about it, mm -hmm. take as many different courses as you can. Um, I wish that I, that, that I had been able to take more courses in things like geology, yeah. uh, in things like genetics. Mm -hmm. um, get as broad an education at the undergraduate level as possible. It will serve you well as you go forward. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, you spending the time with us. And uh, I know that everybody else is going to appreciate it too. So thank you. Thank you, John.